Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. This is the Planning Committee for the Town of Lincoln for Monday, July 9th, 2018. I call this meeting to order. I'd like to do a roll call of council and staff. On my far, far left, uh, starting with council, I have Councillor Pachariva, Mayor Easton, Councillor McPherson, and on my right, Councillor Foster and Councillor Timmers. And then for a staff uh, compliment this evening, the far left of the table is the CAO, Mike Kirkopoulos. To my immediate left, I have Kathleen Dale, who's the Director of Planning and Development. To my right, I have the Town Clerk, Julie Kirkopoulos. In the back row, I have uh, Sarah Ann, who's the Acting Associate Director of Recreation, Culture, and Special And then in the middle, I have Economic Development Officer Paul Diani, and Senior Communications Advisor Carrie Beatty. And in the gallery, I have Matt. I'm going to get the last name incorrect. Guanagolo, who is our IT uh, person for this evening. The next thing on our agenda this evening uh, is a question about declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest from the committee this evening? Seeing none, do any members of the committee wish to have changes in the order of the agenda this evening? Councillor Petrieva? No? Okay, thank you. Um, First thing we're going to get into this evening is our public hearings. And I wish to welcome everybody present this evening for the public hearing section of the Planning Committee agenda and advise the following. The Planning Act requires in Section 3412 that before passing a draft plan of subdivision or zoning bylaw amendment application, Council must hold at least one public meeting for the purpose of informing the public in respect of the amendment. The purpose of the public meeting is to receive comments and consider questions from the public regarding an application for draft plan of subdivision by Milan Brothers Incorporated and a zoning bylaw amendment application by 2228490 Ontario Incorporated Maple Leaf Nurseries. We stress that at this point no decision has been made on the aforementioned. The council will take any comments received into account for their consideration of these items. The Planning Act requires in Section 3414.1 the Council advise the public that a local planning appeal tribunal has the power to dismiss an appeal if an appellant has not provided Council with oral submissions at a public meeting or written submissions before any amendment to the zoning bylaw or draft plan of subdivision is adopted. If you wish to be notified of adoption of the amendment, you must make written requests to the Town's clerk. There is an attendance list over by the door which we would ask everybody present to sign if they wish to be notified of Council's decision. Members of the public are reminded to give their names and addresses when they speak. Please spell your last name. Uh, if approved by Council, a notice of the items passing will be circulated with an appeal period. So our first public hearing is for the purpose of draft plans of subdivision application by Milan Brothers Incorporated. The subject lands are developed for a plan of subdivision known as Mountain Village Vineyard. The plan proposes 34 single detached units, lots one through 34. The plan also proposes a block for a contemporary turning circle and storm detention purposes, block 35. Mm -hmm. Blocks 4.3 meter reserves, block 36 and 37, and a block for future development, block 38. Is there anybody present this evening here uh, to address on behalf of the applicant? If you'd like to come forward, please. Please ensure that the uh, little red light on the microphone is on so that everybody in the gallery can hear you and council can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do, I do have a presentation, so if the screens are able to be turned on. Should be the first one right there. Is that the one? Should be that one. 
There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jared Marcus. I'm here from IBI Group, and I'm here on behalf of my client, uh, Miljan Brothers, who are the owners uh, of the subject lands. Uh, the subject lands uh, are were formerly known as 4113 Fly Road, but the new ad there's those lands were severed, so there's a new address, which is uh, 3627 Camden Road. Uh, and as you've mentioned, the development we're proposing is called Mountain Village Vineyard, and the application is a draft plan of subdivision. Uh, so the first first slide before you, excuse me, first slide before you tonight gives you a, uh, a broader context and location for the subject lands. Uh, they are located within the uh, rural settlement area of Camden. Uh, this image shows the subject lands outlined in red and the uh, urban boundary limits of the rural settlement area shown in, <coughs> excuse me, shown in blue. Uh, generally, our subject lands are vacant. Uh, there is one small single, uh, single story uh, storage shed and that's located in the bottom, uh, bottom southwest or right hand or left hand corner of the uh, red outline and that's uh, storage shed associated with the former agricultural um, use of the lands. Uh, the only other feature of note is a small drainage ditch on the subject lands and that runs uh, from your bottom left to your bottom right and eventually connects up with the Penner Creek uh, and water that watershed which runs, uh, you can see the Penner Creek watershed running from the uh, left hand side of the image across uh, into the rural area and then eventually back down and into uh, connecting with Fly Road. Uh, as I mentioned, the subject lands were severed from a broader land holding, and that broader land holding consists of the farm uh, just to the east of our subject lands, and that would include a uh, large land holding outside of the urban boundary, as well as uh, those lands just to the east of our subject land, and those are within the urban boundary. Uh, generally speaking, our subject lands are surrounded by residential uses to the south, to the south, to the and the west, and just to the west side of Camden Road, uh, you would have the Camden Estates subdivision, which you've seen before and is nearing registration. I should note that the two main roads running through uh, this image are Fly Road going east to west and Camden Road, which is running uh, north to south. Uh, generally to the north of us again is the urban boundary which is shown in that blue and then outside of that is uh, rural, air, rural agricultural lands that are under the control of the Niagara Escarpment Commission. Uh, again to the right hand side or east of our property is the former, uh, former owner of the lands, uh, Mr. Bucknell and then directly to our south is the former salvage yard which has uh, since been cleaned up and essentially decommissioned. Uh, the next, uh, uh, next slide shows you the context of the property within the Camden Neighborhood Secondary Plan. Uh, outlined in blue again is, uh, in blue this time is our subject lands. Uh, the thick black boundary is the urban boundary of the Camden settlement area. Um, again, you have Fly Road which travels west to east through the neighborhood and Camden Road which travels north to south through the neighborhood. Uh, you do see a dashed outline and that is a proposed uh, municipal right of way which runs uh, through, the, uh, through the middle of the northern portion of the neighborhood and that connects from Fly Road uh, and then running east-west through our site and then connecting again on the, along the easterly boundary of the urban area to Fly Road. Uh, generally speaking, the land use designation within the secondary plan is residential and those uh, that's consistent with our subject land. The residential designation allows uh, single detached lots as a predominant land use uh, and that's what we're proposing here tonight. Um, just to the east of our subject lands, you'll see a green area that's an open space area and below our subject lands is a red hatched area and that's the former salvage yard which would be a local commercial designation. Uh, so mainly rural residential or residential surrounding ours as well as within our site. Um, that's the context within the secondary plan. 
Uh, one more thing I'll note about the secondary plan is the green hatched area on the far right easterly boundary, and that area would be uh, the location of a permanent stormwater management pond that was determined through the Camden Master Drainage Plan. Our next slide gives you the context of our development within the zoning bylaw. Again, outlined in blue is the subject lands to provide some context to the red zoning boundaries. Uh, the subject lands and most of the lands within the secondary plan are zoned as residential one and the predominant uh, permitted use within that is single detached dwellings as long as some ancillary uses. Uh, there is a holding zone on the majority of our subject lands and that holding zone would be uh, so it would have to be removed prior to development being allowed to proceed and that holding zone uh, while not explicitly uh, defined would re uh, restrict or would require us to prove uh, servicing capacities uh, and other environmental issues associated with the former agricultural uses. Uh, we are intending to uh, meet all of the parent zoning bylaw regulations, so we do not have an application before you to amend those in any way at this point. Next slide shows you generally some of the, the development details. So the site is uh, approximately 2.82 hectares in size. Uh, as you mentioned, as mentioned earlier, we are proposing 34 single detached dwellings, uh, which would give us a density of approximately 12 units per hectare. Uh, as I mentioned, the property is uh, designated residential and the zoning is residential and the proposed development would comply uh, or conform with both of those. Again, the application before you is a draft plan of, applic uh, draft plan of subdivision. And when we made this draft plan of subdivision, we included a number of reports. Phase one and two ESA report, this confirmed the, uh, that there was no contamination from the prior agricultural uses on site. An archeological assessment which confirmed that there were no cultural heritage artifacts present on the lands. Uh, geotechnical investigation to ensure that the soils uh, are suitable for the proposed use and a preliminary engineering report, functional servicing report, and stormwater management report, which confirms uh, the uh, ability to service the lands. Next slide up shows the actual draft plan of subdivision that we've submitted. Um, again, the property is outlined in red here. Um, so the starting point for us is a connection to an existing municipal road network. And in this case, uh, on the top left-hand side of the boundary, you have uh, one uh, one lot or one the width of one lot which connects uh, our property to Camden Road and this is where we're proposing our main road connection and that would be Street A and Street A uh, as I uh, showed earlier on the secondary plan follows the general layout of the proposed uh, municipal road network from your secondary plan. Uh, so that's our Street A. Street A continues uh, from west to east and terminates at our easterly boundary. Uh, eventually when the lands to the east are developed, that road would continue through and ultimately connect on uh, to Fly Road on the easterly boundary of the uh, uh, urban boundary. Uh, coming off of our Street A, we do have two, uh, two cul-de-sac streets, B and Street C, and those would be designed to uh, municipal standards. Uh, now starting from our west, uh, we do have 13 single detached lots uh, on the north side of Street A, and those abut the urban boundary of the Camden secondary plan. Uh, those continue to the easterly boundary, and when you move southerly from there, you'll see uh, block I believe 34, which is our stormwater management pond, and you'll see a half moon, and that half moon is uh, a temporary, going to be a temporary turning circle for the right of way, and this ensures that any emergency vehicles, snow plows, collect, waste collection, et cetera, have the ability to enter the subdivision, turn around safely, and then exit the subdivision. And again, that'll be temporary until such time as the uh, municipal road connects uh, through its ultimate destination to the easterly boundary and down to Fly Road. Um, just below that half moon is our stormwater management pond. Uh, and again, that would also be a temporary pond. And as I mentioned before, there is a 
permanent pond planned for the easterly boundary of the of the settlement area and until such time as those lands are developed and the pond is built uh, our pond would remain in place and for our development and so that'll collect all the surface drainage from the lots and the municipal roads uh, go into a quality control system and then outlet back into the uh, drainage ditch which you'll see runs from uh, from the wet along the southerly boundary from the west to the east and that connects to Penner Creek and that watershed so our water would be uh, redirected to our temporary pond cleaned and then outlet it back into the ditch and then to the creek ultimately uh, now as you move west from uh, from that pond, again, we had the two cul-de-sac roads on the south side of Street A. Uh, those are known going to be Streets A or Streets B and C, and each of those cul-de-sacs has ten single detached lots on it. And again, that, those bulbs are designed uh, to accommodate municipal uh, emergency vehicles, regional waste collection, snow plows, etc. And lastly, as you get to the bottom left-hand corner of that sketch, you'll see one lot, that's lot 34, and it has direct frontage onto Camden Road. So we'll have th three private streets with 33 single detached lots on them, and one single detached lot which has direct frontage onto um, Camden Road. Uh, what's not exactly clear on this sketch uh, is just to the south of our entrance road, Street A, there is a future development block, and that future development block is uh, hopefully going to be uh, sold to the owner to the south, otherwise it will just remain in ownership of the, uh, of the current owner of the lands. Um, to the north side of Street A at the site entrance and then on the easterly boundary of Street A there are two one-foot reserves and those one-foot reserves restrict access to the municipal road from either the lot to the north of Street A or future development lands to the east. The next slide shows you a colorized concept of the draft plan and this shows you a general idea or gives you a general idea of the potential building envelopes for our single detached lots. Uh, now these lots are, or these envelopes are shown to the minimum zoning bylaw setbacks uh, and they show only the areas on site that can be developed, not, not necessarily how large an actual house would be on those lots. Uh, some of those lots are fairly large and the zone parent zoning bylaw does have a 40% lot coverage, uh, which at this time we would be planning on respecting. Uh, so the, the color of yellow doesn't represent a building necessarily, but a area where a building can be sited. Um, again, built to the, uh, or designed to the minimum setbacks of the zoning bylaw. So uh, similar to the draft plan, you start from Camden Road on the left side, uh, Street A continues in and terminates at the easterly boundary where you'll see that half moon again. That half moon is the temporary turning circle. On the north side, you have the 13 lots, and then to the south, you have the two uh, cul-de-sacs with 10 lots on each cul-de-sac. And then in the darker green, you have the temporary stormwater management pond, which uh, ultimately outlets to the creek. And then you have your one single detached lot on Camden Road. And the light green color is generally to show uh, amenity space within each lot, as well as the green space within uh, the boulevards of the municipal right-of-way. Uh, and the last slide that I have for you is a sample building on or elevation for this project. Uh, this project is intended to be uh, custom designed homes, so there are no uh, formal building uh, elevations that are available. But this building elevation uh, will be representative of the project. The builders are the same as the Early Dawn Estates project, which is located uh, to the south of here. Uh, hopefully same same builder, same owners, so uh, we're confident that the houses will be of the similar quality and style to those homes. So those are our submissions for you tonight, and if there are any questions from uh, this committee or the public, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the committee? Councillor Foster. Thank you very much. The, uh, can you go back um, uh, one slide to the... Uh, Okay, that's good. So the creek that, or the, the waterway that's through there um, is meandering in and through this. So 
What do you do from a drainage point of view with that? Like, is that now buried pipes, or, or what happens with that? Um, my, my understanding of the, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, my understanding of the creek is that it's uh, it's generally dry most of the year, and that just during the spring, fall, it will have some wetness area. But as a general rule of thumb, uh, any new development must capture its own water and direct its own water to a treatment facility for and into an ultimate uh, outlet into a creek or some other body of water. Uh, we don't have detailed engineering, but some of the preliminary stuff uh, shows us that we are going to have to um, that that those will just be re that'll be regraded into lots, and those lots will have to drain into the s streets. Whether that's uh, catch basins and leads to a municipal sewer or overland swales, we don't have those hard details yet. Uh, it is very preliminary at this stage, uh, but ultimately we'll be capturing our own water. But those that that ditch wouldn't be piped, but it would be uh, uh, filled in or filled o like graded over. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Camden, since day one of, of me being on council, has always been a fascinating area from a drainage point of view. Um, you go to the opposite side of the town and you end up with, I, I call Dave Wood's place, Lake Woods, um, or Lake of the Woods, in the springtime, just simply because of the amount of water that's coming in and through there. So. So it, this is one I think that the municipality has to take a real good look at, because I, I have no idea if, if this is as bad as, as the rest as it's going on. So drainage is always important in Camden, so. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Timmers. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Thompson. Through you to the uh, delegation. Um, the, I'm glad you brought that up, Councillor Foster, about the drainage because it is an issue up there. I do live in Camden, so I'm very familiar with the area. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the street A. So at the very end of the street, it, you, you're going to have like bollards or something? It's just going to be a street that just ends and it's blocked? And you talked about that street one day joining to Fly Road, so it would have to be, it would have to have a turn. Right, so this is the, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, this slide again is the Camden Neighborhood Secondary Plan. So when this plan was done all those years ago, it was envisioned that that municipal road would connect all the way through uh, east to west and connecting to Fly Road on this. Um, and so as each development pr proceeds, um, you have to be able to provide for those turnarounds. So, oh, we're on wait. So this slide, you'll see the half moon just at the edge of the boundary. So there would be a, a paved cul-de-sac uh, similar to the two formal cul-de-sacs, streets B and C, and that would exist until future development. So okay. in you know unknown time length, it'll always be there, it'll be to a municipal standard. Whether there's bollards or a guardrail at the end, I'm not too sure what the municipal standards require for a situation like this. It, it's uh, almost identical to the Camden Estates uh, development to the west, on the west side of Camden, uh, Camden Road here. So whether it's bollards or a guardrail, there will likely be some form of barrier from the lands to the east to ensure people don't just travel off and into the okay, farmland. That's, that's good. I, I I think I just wanted to see how far that, where the, the rest of the plan, where the road was going to, so I see it now. Um, my other question is that half circle, is that sufficient enough for a garbage truck to turn around or is if they're coming in, like is it big enough to turn around, the car I, I, at the end there? I, I'm just. Um. Yeah, it's hard to see a dimension there. The, if you look at the uh, streets B and C here, those are, uh, I believe they're 13 meter radii and that's a typical turning radii for the region's waste collection. All right. And that's how it's been designed. We don't have technical details yet from staff on that, so, but we're confident that's the Okay, that's fair the enough, I design. just found it unusual. I just was wondering about it. Now you also mentioned something about the block the stormwater management pond being a temporary? Did you say that when you're in your, um, that it would be a temporary till 
At what point? If you could just talk about that uh, again. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the, the temporary swim pond, again, is temporary in the same sense as the cul-de-sac. It will have to exist to full municipal standards until such time as the final storm pond is built on the east. So it's not as if this is just a temporary stopgap measure. It is going to be designed to full storm, full municipal standards for a stormwater management pond. So it's, it's almost a throwaway cost for my client because you can't cheap out on it. It has to be able to function as if that will exist forever. So it'll be a full, fully designed, fully implemented stormwater management pond, but it's temporary in the sense that when a f final one is built in the Sutton neighborhood, that could be decommissioned and become residential lots. But for the time being, we have to treat it as if that final scenario doesn't exist. All right, I just wanted to clarify on your temporary. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other? Councilor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and my question may be directed to the staff, and it's, uh, it's as we're starting to see more development in Camden, you know, we've got the 14 homes, I think, over there, and now we've got these homes, and we've got the homes across the street. We're starting to build out a little community here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a question around uh, active transportation and parks and trails and, and things like that, that, um, you know, I know that, um, you know, it's, it's not um, really a, a fly road is not something that is easily crossed. So I'm wondering what the plan is for, for the future for uh, parks and trails. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Sarah Ann, would you like to respond to that? And then Kathleen. Three, Mr. Chair, uh, most recently the Community Services Department completed a Parks, Trails and Grounds asset inventory um, just this past month and that information was uh, sent to the planning consultant that's been secured for the Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan. Staff are going out into the field with that consultant in August to review all of the Parks, Trails, um, connectivity gaps, if you will, in the community to make sure that that's a highlight and a planning focus throughout the planning efforts in the next year for the Master Plan. Thank you. <coughs> Director Dale. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, as is outlined on the secondary plan map, there is a proposed park um, that was part of the secondary plan when it was originally done. Um, so that park would be acquired when the lands immediately to the east are developed. Um, the other alternative that the municipality has is to look at acquiring it ahead of time. So that those are the two options. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, so that piece of property, if I have got it right, is on the south side of Fly Road on the uh, e far east side of the diagram. Is that, is that correct? Is that it, Director right Dale? Oh, the, this little piece right here? Okay, no, I was thinking this here. Please go ahead, Director. Because nobody in the gallery can see what you're pointing Sorry. at. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, so um, the map that's up on the screen, it shows a blue line where the lands that are subject to the plan of subdivision application. If you go immediately to the east, there's an area that um, ha that's green and has sort of like little dots on it. Um, so immediately to the east is the area that has been identified in the secondary plan for the future park, and it's on the north side of Fly Road. So is that is that where the pond area is? No, I'm totally confused. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, the pond. There's there's two greens on this map. Um, it's hard to see. One of the greens looks like grass, little grass spots, and the other one is a more of a triangular hatch. So the triangular hatch is natural area, and I don't know the exact location because I don't have the, sec the master plan with me, but uh, where the proposed right-of-way turns south towards Fly Road, in that general area, there is a permanent pond proposed. And so the grass hatches uh, just to the east of my 
subject lands is a open space designation. And then at the corner of Tin Turn and Fly Road, there's another open space designation in that location. So those would be parks. And then the darker green is uh, natural area and stormwater management. So the, the park, the proposed park is this green strip right in the middle of the diagram. The rectangular Thank piece, you. yes. Yeah, certainly we can we can ask staff at a later time. For well, I, th I, th I think this is important as the, as this community gets built out that we've got uh, and you know generally, you know that's a pretty attractive uh, home that you're building. You know that that size of home, single detached homes. You know I think the families are going to be buying into those homes, and uh, you know we're going to need to provide for those families. So uh, I think planning ahead and, and having a park available there makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else from committee? Mary Easton, please go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm also concerned about um, this, the configuration of the stream, the potential for climate change. I mean, this really is quite a wet area. Um, and stays wet for a long time. So uh, what would be the planning around bringing that information forward so that we would be able to see what what's um, in the works? I understand there may be um, temporary and then more permanent, but um, in the event that this other piece doesn't get developed for 10 or 12 more years, who knows, um, I'd like to see something um, I'd like to have a much better understanding of what this looks like, because at the present time, it appears as if this stream is running under the houses. Okay. Director Dale, do you want to comment on when that would that information would come back? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, at this point, this is a this is a public meeting. Um, we don't have all of the comments from all of the respective agencies or town departments. Um, staff will make sure that that issue. Um, is addressed so that there be further information in the recommendation report at a subsequent date. Right. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, through you to the presenter. Um, Jared, I, I like the way um, this presentation has been done and the way that the different features have been layered. <clears throat> it helps quite a bit in terms of um, trying to develop a context. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, I think uh, you, you certainly provided us with quite a bit of detail, but certainly that whole business of climate change and the wetness of this area is, we do have some concerns. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to think about that, <clears throat> that green line. If, that, if I'm reading this correctly, and that truly is the park, um, maybe as we go along a little further, <clears throat> that green line, is that green line the park area? Is that, that a serious demonstration? This, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, this image is the Camden Neighborhood Secondary Plan. So that's part of your official plan, which outlines uh, how the Camden set settlement area will grow. Uh, so that's enshrined in place in the official plan. We're not proposing any changes. We're working with what that is. Uh, so that green line, uh, I can't really answer whether staff have plans to buy that or whether they're comfortable waiting. Uh, our development, of course, subject to the Planning Act, would require parkland or cash in lieu of parkland or ded land dedication. Um, and we don't have those comments from staff, but my understanding was uh, that given the areas within the neighborhood that are designated for open space, that cash in lieu would be uh, taken at uh, as part of this development, but that's uh, that's something staff would have to provide confirmation of. Okay, could you tell me uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, approximately how much space we're talking about here? Oh. I mean, is this a 50 feet? Is this 50 feet wide, or um, it's very difficult to? Perhaps uh, Director Dale might be able to. Okay, <laughs> I don't think that's part of this gentleman's presentation, unfortunately. So is it, Mayor, is it okay if, if staff comes back with it? Oh yes, for absolutely. Okay, it's just an you. alert. I, I think it's important. We don't want to make a decision about cash and lieu until we have all the information we don't have right at the moment. And there is no park there at the moment. So again, if it's 10 or 12 years and this is all 
built out, then we certainly want to make sure that uh, that there's uh, there are amenities in place from the get-go. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Petriva, did you have comments? No, you're good. Thank you. Anybody else with comments on to the, or questions to the presenter? I have one question, Mr. Go Chairman. Ahead, Mr. Chairman, do we have the um, owner of this um, subdivision here this evening? Yes, we do, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being involved in the process. Okay, seeing no more questions for the presenter. Is there anybody else here this evening wishing to uh, to speak to this uh, this application? If you if you come on forward and uh, please state your name and spell your last name and your address for the the record. Uh, it's Russell Vanderhorst. It's V A N D E R H O R S T. Uh, 4181 Fly Road. Um, in regards to uh, the talks about the uh, the swale, the drainage, and that, uh, my property is uh, directly south uh, of lot 29 and 28, uh, directly west of the old scrapyard. Um, I know through a uh, deceased member of the uh, rental property that is beside me, that the property there was backfilled a number of years ago uh, when the property had to be cleaned up and backfilled to the point where my yard is completely flooded, almost like last year, right, flooded till August because we had such a, a wet spring uh, going on. Now, this drainage here, it really concerns me because having these properties, even if they're at the same grade as mine, it's quite a level area and even going up towards this future swim pond is is not a low, it's not a direct flow. Uh, so I don't want this property to end up, you know, causing more concerns to my property being flooded uh, because there's more water running off uh, from the lots 30, 29, 28, and 27 that are directly north of mine. Uh, I know that Streets B and C have to be built up higher to be uh, acquire for the sewers to be able to drain down to Camden Road. Uh, I was also told once that these lots would most likely have a walkout basement. Uh, therefore, you know, from the top of the front of the house, everything's going to be draining back to where our two properties were to meet. Um, so that's one of the concerns that I I have in this. Uh, my other uh, concern is just the. Uh, kind of the privacy that we're losing. I mean, we all kind of moved to Camden because it's a little country city. You know, now we're kind of losing that, that view. We're gonna have to be looking at a subdivision, which isn't what we're all excited necessarily to be looking at. Um, so in that, I don't know if there's allowances or, or rules or what to say that, you know, there has to be a fence, some sort of uh, privacy to, you know, uh, houses that are, backing onto these properties. Um, that's something that we'd like to see, maybe something that can be pushed forward. Uh, and you know, we're not talking something that's four feet high, six feet high, but maybe something that's at least eight feet high. Um, as, as well as, uh, you know, you're taking a, a country away by adding all these homes, uh, maybe the uh, addition of mature trees uh, being added, transplanted, uh, even if they're in the zoning of these future backyards and that just to still create that country look and not bulldoze everything down and start with piddly little six foot tall trees that take 10 years to grow. <laughs> um, but those are my concerns from my point of view from uh, where I live and uh, the biggest one being the drainage issue. Um, and I did have a question as, as far as you guys were talking about parks and that and the, you know, thinking this park might happen 10 years or so, who knows when this other property will be developed, but there's also the closure of the old fire hall that is located on the south side of Fly Road as the new one is being built presently. I don't know if there's something that can be done with that land as far as a park or um, pavilion or something for the neighborhood. Thank you very much for your comments. Are there any questions to the, uh, the gentleman speaking on committee? Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else 
here this evening wishing to speak to this application. Please come forward, state your name, please spell your last name and your address for the record, thank you. Good evening, my name is James Gertzen, G-O-E-R-Z-E-N. I live at 3625 Camden Road, which is the property directly south of entrance of Street A off of Camden Road. Um, my one concern is with all these uh, numbers of, of lots being developed and they are going to be appealing to families and there are a lot of families in Camden with young children and so the park ID is awesome, it's great. I'm just more concerned about with that many lots going in, there's going to be at least one car per household. Is there, and that's going to increase traffic flow immensely, especially just on Camden Road, which is the only entrance right now. Um, is there going to be some sort of traffic light or crosswalk at Camden and Fly Road or a, an actual sidewalk along the whole way? Because it's going to get quite a bit busier, especially with kids wanting to go for walks and whichever. I'm just thinking more of safety um, of the, the amount of traffic flow and more families coming in. Thank you very much for your, your submission. Any questions from committee? Councillor Chambers? I don't have a question, just I think your idea of the sidewalks is definitely something that needs to be looked at because they are lacking in that area, so thank you for bringing that comment. And the other, just the other, um, to the other gentleman that spoke regarding fencing, um, as, we, if we go, as we go through the process, that is something that you can put your comments in and make sure that you, you make your, your wishes known about the fencing around that development, if and when we get there. But I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else here this evening wishing to speak to this application? Is there anybody else here this evening wishing to speak to this application? Third and last time, is there anybody else here wishing to speak to this application this evening? Seeing none, I declare this public meeting closed. Thank you for your submissions. Our second public hearing this evening is for, oh, sorry, I've got a motion. Moved by Councillor Foster and seconded by Councillor Timmers. And for reasons outlined in PL 18-42, it's hereby recommended that, the rep that this report regarding draft plan or subdivision application PL SUB 20180053 in the name of Milgen Brothers Incorporated be received for information and that recommendation report be prepared once all comments have been received and issues have been addressed. One moment, please. Any questions from committee? Your pleasure on this motion? Motion is carried, thank you. Our second public hearing this evening is for the purposes of zoning bylaw amendment application by 2228490 Ontario Incorporated, Maple Leaf Nurseries. The zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted to permit Maple Leaf Nurseries to lease 2.32 hectares of their 8.9 hectares farm to Lincoln Landscape Construction Supplies to operate as an agriculturally re related use that is directly associated with the nursery crop on the property as well as the nursery crop owned by Maple Leaf Nurseries. The amendment would bring the existing land use into compliance by establishing a provision that recognizes that landscaping business as a component of Maple Leaf Nurseries overall agricultural operations. Hugh Fraser, you're here already, from OTB Farm Solutions is here to speak to report PL 1843, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment application by Maple Leaf Nurseries. Mr. Fraser, please go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Good, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the chance to, uh, to talk to the Planning Committee tonight. So again, my name is Hugh Fraser uh, with OTB Solutions, 8 Jellico Drive in uh, St. Catharines, L2N6J2. 
I'm joined here with Ted Sikama, who is uh, with Maple Leaf Nurseries. Uh, Bernie Langendoon, who is also a co-owner, is not here with us tonight. Um, there's also a few landscape contractors uh, in, the, uh, in the audience here tonight. So again, thanks for the opportunity to address your committee. So what is Maple Leaf Nurseries applying for? First of all, they're asking for an amendment to the town zoning bylaw for a 2.3 hectare piece of land currently zoned agricultural, and the town's planning department considers it to be an existing use and agriculture related. So the existing use is uh, Lincoln Landscape Construction Supply is a wholesaler of land hardscape materials on this property. So hardscape materials is a term that's used in the landscape uh, industry. Uh, it means stone, pavers, wood, uh, anything that you'd use in a in a uh, in a landscape uh, operation that aren't growing, sort of so to speak. The the bylaw amendment would allow Lincoln Landscape Construction Supply to offer landscape businesses, wholesale, a one-stop service for customers. So the hardscape materials by Lincoln Landscape Construction Supply and the plants and mulch and other materials that Maple Leaf Nurseries um, uh, would supply and sort of a symbiotic relationship, uh, so to speak. Who is Maple Leaf Nurseries? They're kind of the best kept secret, I would say, in the Vineland area. They've been owned uh, since 1992 by Ted Sikama and Bernie Langendoon, both who uh, live in, in Lincoln. They're wholesale producers of mainly perennial plants, uh, serving landscape designers uh, and contractors uh, and garden centers uh, all over the Golden Horseshoe um, in Ontario. They're also in Quebec, and they also sell across the border into New York. Uh, they own and rent about 133 hectares, uh, 325 uh, plus acres north of, of Vineland, probably one of the largest landholders and users of land in, uh, in, in Lincoln, or at least in the, in the horticulture industry. <coughs> and it's a very, uh, very successful, very large operation. Now I'm going to show you a uh, a one-minute video. Um, um, it was it was flown by a drone by uh, by Ted's uh, son-in-law, family member James Harskamp. So I want to give him full credit for this, and I'll just let you uh, uh, take a look at it. There is some music with it. I'm not sure if you're going to hear it. It doesn't really much matter. It just gives you a sense. Whoops. I'm going to go back again. Not sure why that did that. Do this again. Here we go. Okay, so that's uh, just a one-minute video. It doesn't tell you everything they do, but um, it certainly gives you a sense of uh, the scope of this operation. So how the uh, Maple Leaf Nurseries and Lincoln Landscape Construction Supply relationship actually works, um, the way I'm told, homeowners uh, are doing way less landscaping on their own now. Um, they have no time, they have no expertise, they want somebody else to do it. People can't afford cottages and so they're turning their front and backyards into the cottage and uh, you can you can see that I'm sure all of you know people that do that and so landscapers bring their customers to Lincoln Landscape Construction Supply to show them what they can offer in hardscape materials and plants and mulches that uh, Maple Leaf uh, Nurseries uh, supplies so that's how this how this symbiotic relationship 
uh, works. Now, there has been some concern, questions, is what one of the main concerns about this whole thing is, is this a retail operation? No, it is not a retail operation. It is a wholesale operation. First of all, uh, Lincoln Landscape Construction Supplies wholesale office is in an old chicken barn uh, on this property. Um, and it's not exactly where you would open a retail uh, store uh, in, in the Vineland area. So it's in an old chicken barn. There are very few items uh, on display in this, in this place. Uh, this entire area where they display things and talk to uh, landscapers isn't even as big as this room. So that gives you a sense of the size of the place. Um, they open really early in the morning before homeowners would even want to get up and they close early in the evening or early in the afternoon catering to the landscape operations. And so this is not a retail uh, um, operation at all. There's no prices on anything. If you go into the store, there's no prices. The only way you can get a price is go to, uh, to, the, uh, to the people at Lincoln Landscape and they will tell you what the price is. So there's no prices on anything. And if you go in there, you'll find pails of screws that cost $200, uh, bigger than things you'd find at Home Depot. You're never gonna be buying that kind of stuff as a, as a homeowner. So I wanna assure you that this is not a retail operation. Now to give you a sense of what this, what we're asking for here tonight, I want you to direct your uh, attention to this, to this sketch here. And I don't think you can see my cursor. Just tell me, can you see my cursor? Perfect, that's what I wanna know. Okay, so this property is known locally as the Hoover Farm. Okay, it's uh, Ellen Hoover is a 95 year old lady. She still lives on this uh, property up in this, uh, uh, northwest corner. The total property is 8.9 hectares, 22 acres. The uh, half of that is now cropped by Maple Leaf Nursery. So they have about 11 acres in crop here and the other 50% of it is what I would call permanently damaged cropland. There used to be a fruit processing plant um, back in the 1950s. This used to be uh, called Vineland Station. This was a, a stop here and they'd pick up fruit and things like that. And back in the 50s, there was uh, uh, a, a big um, processing plant here and that whole area has been destroyed as far as agriculture is concerned. You can't grow a thing on it. And so this is where they're talking about asking for a bylaw amendment. The, um, what they're asking for is 2.3 hectares in the bylaw amendment it would still leave 2.15 hectares still in homes. There's two or three homes on that property, I think, Ted. Two, two homes on that property, and there's uh, three other barns that are on there. There's two chicken barns. The Hoovers used to have uh, chicken broilers uh, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s, and even later, I believe. Um, and so that's what they're asking for. This is the railway right here on the north and this is Victoria Avenue on the west and 23rd Street on the east. So you can get a sense of where this property is. Now really, because of the, it looks, looks even bigger than it really is, but really there's only about 1.4 hectares on this property that's actually usable in the bylaw amendment because there's very steep slopes uh, up against the railway, uh, there's a number of trees along there, uh, scrub land. Uh, there's a pond in here. Uh, there's a, some, a bit of uh, trees over here. So the only area that really is, is in this bylaw amendment is what's shown here in red. The chicken barn that they're in is actually right about where my cursor is sitting here right now. Um, and so that's where, where that is right now. Why does this application make sense? Well, first of all, it's an innovative way to use land that's not fit for crops. If they could grow crops on this, they would grow crops. That's what they do for a living, but it, you can't grow crops on this thing. It's not even, the shape of it, it doesn't even allow you to put greenhouses on it. It's, it's, it's such a, a, an odd shape and it's just not fit for that. It's a symbiotic use. 
at value added, it helps Lincoln Landscape construction supply and it helps Maple Leaf Nurseries, it helps them both out. It adapts to a shifting consumer market, which uh, really is, is completely different than it was even 10 years ago. It enhances the town's economic opportunities. It's an adaptive reuse of an empty chicken barn. They could put chickens back in this barn probably any if they wanted to but they don't want to they want to use use this chicken barn for something else and we believe it also supports the town's uh, desire to be a center of excellence for uh, for agriculture um, so this is good for the town we believe it's good for the town Lincoln landscape construction supply has been there since 2016 um, there's no changes planned for what is there right now that's already been there for, for two years. Many people don't even realize it's there. There's no new buildings planned. Nothing will change. Everything's above ground and everything is already there. This area represents about 2% of all the acres that Maple Leaf Nursery uh, farms in the Vineland area. Uh, landscapers love the one-stop location. Uh, the other night at the uh, last week at the planning um, uh, at the open house, uh, we had several landscapers come and, and say how much they, uh, they enjoy having this place here, how much time it saves them, how much money it saves them, and traveling time and everything else, because there's nothing like this uh, just locally. So Maple Leaf Nurseries is growing. They're adding customers uh, every time. Every time I go to Ted to ask him for more information, they seem to have more acreage under, under cultivation and they have more uh, crops. They're gonna be getting into propagation, which is a, a huge change for them or a, an additional thing that they're gonna be getting into. They have a lot of family involved in the property and they have uh, more employees all the time. Finally, they are a growing successful agricultural business. They have about 30 full-time uh, employees right now and about 50 seasonal staff. Again, several landscapers showed up to give their support at the open house on June 27th. And I wanna make this very clear. It's very tough making farms profitable with high land prices, especially in the Vineland area. The land is very expensive here. High wages uh, and the minimum wage, even if it's gonna get frozen, it's still high. Um, they have a lot of tough competition and only the innovators can actually survive in horticulture. That's just the way it, it is uh, these days. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if uh, you have any questions, I'd be pleased to try to answer them. If I can't, Ted said he'll answer all the questions I can't. Perfect, thank you very much, Mr. Fraser. <coughs> any questions from committee? Mary Easton, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do have a, a number of questions. I'm pleased to see that this application is is coming forward and that um, there's an um, effort here to bring everything into compliance, which is the intention. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to um, understand better uh, about the buildings. I know there's a number of buildings there. Um, I don't know whether they're all in use now. Is that the case? So there's three, and Ted, correct me if, uh, if I say something wrong here, but there's three buildings there right now. The, the youngest or the, the newest uh, poultry barn is the one that's furthest east, and that's the one that, that Lincoln Landscape Construction Supply is in. Uh, it's a two-story uh, chicken broiler barn. Uh, there are two other chicken broiler barns, uh, much older, uh, one is a little younger and one's quite old. It was a, an, an old, old barn that had been adapted for chicken broilers. It, so one of them has, uh, definitely has, um, I think you're doing some equipment uh, repairs and things like that in one of them, and the other one's empty. Storage. storage. The, other one's, the other one's in storage. Uh, there's another old, old barn that really is not of use, any use whatsoever, really. No. It's out right near Victoria. Uh, then there's two houses on that property. There's a small garage, and that's about it for okay. buildings. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm interested to know, um, I'm pleased that you're thinking about propagation because I've been reading some articles about mm -hmm. the difficulty in high-quality uh, nursery stock um, being available. So this is a great opportunity, again, for Lincoln to, to deal in specialization. Uh, will that take place on this property? Was that the plan? Uh, I don't believe it would take 
place on this property, but I'm going to let Ted answer that. Where would the propagation happen? The propagation is going to happen. Sorry. Say your, say your name. My name is Ted Sycamore. Do I have to spell it? Thank you. Um, the propagation will take place at one of our other farms at this point. We have no, no plan at this point to um, bring propagation there. What we do like to bring there is more caliber trees, larger, larger material stuff that we might not be growing, but that we'll be growing on. Um, we don't do everything from start to finish. We do some stuff two thirds of the way, three quarters of the way, and then we just will grow it on and then sell it. And that's one of the things that that is done extensively in the Hamilton and Toronto area. Maury was the largest one in this area. Maury has closed the door, so Maury's not around anymore. And that's something that we have to, as budgets allow, will add to that property so that so the overall shopping experience for the landscaper is a little more complete. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Mr. Chairman, then should we understand that eventually some of the, that two of the barns will be torn down? Is that the plan? I'm just trying not, to get a sense of what this not is. Not right now, no. Like. Barns are very, very expensive to put up, so um, we will try to find some use for them, some meaningful use. Okay, all right. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, then, as far as I can see at the moment, there's only access off of Victoria. And um, so through you, Mr. Chairman, is that the, is that the access and egress that um, you're expecting to use in the future? Well, there is access also off of 23rd as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, Mr. Chairman, maybe we could have some clarification on the primary um, on the primary uh, access point. I'm just thinking about what the entrance is like in terms of how it comes right down so abruptly on on uh, onto Victoria. Well, thank you very much. Um, video was great. It certainly gives us a good idea of the the scale of what you're up to. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. No question about it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mayor. Any other? Questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anybody else here this evening wishing to speak to this application? Please come forward, state your name, spell it, and your address for the clerk. And when you're ready, please go ahead. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Dave Clausen. I'm from Newport Landscaping. I live in Vineland. Um, we uh, serve the primarily in the town of Lincoln, um, but also the entire Niagara region. Uh, I employ 18 people. Um, Lincoln Landscape Supply uh, is, is great for our community because uh, it saves us driving all the way to St. Catharines to buy stuff and also kind of fills uh, kind of a hole in the market because we don't have um, some place to buy stuff for uh, landscaping in, in Vineland or beam soil, really. So that's what I have to say. Is there anybody else here wishing to speak for or against this application? Is there anybody else here wishing to speak to this application this evening? Third and final time. Is there anybody else here wishing to speak to this application this evening? Seeing no one, I'm going to declare this public meeting uh, to address zoning bylaw amendment application 222284 by 2228490 Ontario Incorporated, Maple Leaf Nurseries, closed. I have a motion moved by Councillor Timmers, seconded by Councillor Foster. For the reasons outlined in PL 18-43, it's hereby recommended that the report regarding zoning bylaw amendment application PLZBA 20180086 in the name of Maple Leaf Nurseries be received for information and that a recommendation report be prepared once all comments have been received and issues have been addressed. Any questions to the motion? Committee's pleasure on the motion? The motion is carried. Thanks for joining us this evening.
Next this evening, we have a delegation. The delegation is Dave Hayworth, official plan policy consultant with the Niagara Region, to present a new official plan timeframe and frameworks for priority background studies. Mr. Hayworth, I see you're ready to go. Yes. So please, please go ahead. Um, good evening, Chair, Mayor, uh, committee members, and uh, senior staff and uh, public in the uh, gallery. It's a pleasure to uh, come and speak to our local partners this evening and inform you as to what's happening with the development of the region's new official plan. So why a new official plan? Uh, originally, the region's uh, planning uh, role and content of the official plan from back in the early 70s mainly dealt with agriculture, preserving agricultural lands, and urban boundary lines. And over the years, the region's mandate in terms of what it has to manage from a planning perspective has grown substantially. Um, the framework of planning has changed substantially in terms of the hierarchy of planning from the province to the region to the local municipalities. And the platform that the region has been uh, using uh, all along is the same platform and there's been amendments to that platform. And uh, that's an older, outdated platform. So now the, what the region has to deal with, growth management, natural heritage, uh, more contemporary agricultural issues, transportation servicing is all more complex and interrelated. So we want to develop a new official plan that has a more contemporary platform to integrate all those policies. And in a sense as well as provide pictorial diagrams, commenting boxes alongside policies so that it's a more user-friendly document for planners, uh, council members, and the public as well. Um, in 2016, Regional Council provided resources for the completion of the official plan over the next five years. We just had a special meeting of Council on July 5th, which was uh, uh, very beneficial in hearing uh, more comments from Council members as well as some of the public in terms of what they would like to see in the new official plan. In the meantime, uh, we've been developing required uh, background studies that will inform the official plan in terms of providing input, providing the planning evidence, planning science to provide input into the development of the policies of the official plan. So some of the preliminary draft objectives that are more internal objectives that we've been uh, uh, providing to the councils and the public are to promote and achieve great development outcomes that contribute to complete community solutions and quality urban experiences, facilitate opportunities for economic growth, protect regional, natural, and agricultural resources and adequately we respond to the challenges of climate change, to provide clear policy direction where necessary and discretion where appropriate, address provincial requirements, regional mandate matters, and provide guidance to local area municipalities, and the new official plan will be processed under Section 26 of the Planning Act. And for a new official plan under Section 26, uh, it's important for us to work with our, our local partners and the province. It's a bit of a dance where we obviously want to develop a plan that conforms to provincial policies but can address local issues as best as possible. Ultimately, when council, regional council adopts the official plan, it goes off to the province and they approve that or a version of that, it's not appealable. So you've probably heard in the past about the regional comprehensive review, which was primarily growth management related. And it's still growth management related, but it also encompasses all the el other elements of the official plan, natural heritage, agriculture, et cetera. So in a sense, the Municipal Comprehensive Review is now the new official plan, the development of the new official plan for the region. 
So there's gonna be key priority background studies, which are going to inform draft policies, uh, which will comprise the new official plan. So the general policy input framework or, or consultation framework, I should say, for the background studies is uh, complete background, compilation of background work, get some input, stakeholders, public, et cetera. Develop options, get input. Create recommendations from the options, get the input, and then develop, a, that, that will inform the creation of policy, and then we'll get input on that. And I should say that the official plan will be done in sections, the, the policy sections, they'll be endorsed by Regional Planning Committee and Council, and then they'll be put aside, and once all the sections are endorsed, they'll be compiled and brought forward <laughs> as a formal document for approval with the formal public meetings, et cetera. So this, this uh, slide shows all the different key priority background studies we're working on. We've started uh, initiating now. We've done completed the frameworks. They've been approved by regional council with the input of area local uh, planning area uh, planners. And you can see it's shown as a puzzle to show the interrelationship of all the different uh, sections and uh, background studies. So under growth management, we have the land needs assessment or land budget, employment land strategy, urban structure, and housing strategy. So for the land needs assessment, we want to determine the amount of developable land needed for residential and employment purposes to 2041. We want to identify excess lands. There are lands that are, won't be uh, developed uh, before 2041. Uh, we want to look at alternative density targets to the required 80 people and jobs per hectare that the province requires. We, there's an opportunity to rationalize urban boundaries uh, regionally and ensure that there's sufficient lands that are in the proper location to accommodate growth. And urban boundary expansions can take place even if there are excess lands, but there has to be a de-designation of lands within the region. And that de-designation has to be greater than the amount that you're expanding. Employment land strategy, uh, we want to ensure sufficient and marketable supply for traditional industrial employment. Identify regional employment areas, areas of business and economic activity for long-term development, which are to be protected from conversion, and these are usually clusters of uh, parcels and development for, for that purpose. Uh, the, cur the region is currently working with local municipalities, specifically area planners at this stage on identifying employment areas. <laughs> and this project will be informed by the region's annual employment inventory as well. Urban structure, uh, the urban structure is a significant component of the region to achieve, achieve an eventual 60% intensification rate under the growth plan. Uh, we want to identify a hierarchy of settlement areas, and then within settlement areas, we want to identify uh, in a hierarchy or of intensification nodes that uh, can be served by uh, public transit, public works, and community infrastructure and services. And we want to assign population and density accordingly. So a, kind of a draft uh, urban structure components that we've just started to uh, provide some discussion towards with area planners, et cetera, is uh, downtown St. Catharines Urban Growth Center, which is recognized by the province in the growth plan, downtown Niagara Falls and downtown Welland Emerging Urban Centers, major grow transit station areas. These are the four go transit secondary plans that uh, we've been partnering with the local municipalities on other regional growth areas. An example of that would be uh, the Brock District Plan that was completed for the region's plan and we're doing an amendment for now. And we've started uh, a district plan for the Glendale area as well. Then you have regional corridors, uh, major regional roads that, that link municipal 
urban centers together where we can identify some intensification area where they're serviced by public transit, et cetera. And then local municipalities can identify areas within their official plan, local centers and local corridors. For the housing strategy, we want to promote an appropriate range and mix of housing forms, promote choice, aging in place opportunities and affordability, set affordable ownership and rental housing targets, identify tools to support uh, affordable housing, align with the housing and homelessness action plan, and support complete communities. For the Rural and Natural Her uh, Systems Management Program, we have agriculture, natural environment, aggregate resources, and climate change. So for the agricultural framework, we wanna recognize agriculture as a primar primary driver of the regional economy, protect the, the unique land, update specific policies such as agriculture related and on-farm diversified uses. And then consider some comments, uh, excellent comments we got from area planners regarding viability of certain agricultural lands, refinement to the province's agricultural systems mapping, how wineries are addressed in the Niagara Scarpment Plan and the province's permitted use guidelines, the importance of agricultural impact assessments, the importance of compatibility between the natural heritage system and agricultural system, and then uh, there's been concerns raised about uh, the use of greenhouse for cannabis operations that we would have to look into. The natural environment and water systems planning, we will be a, this will be a significant and very important component of the uh, new official plan to meet provincial policy direction. It has been recognized that accurate mapping and appropriate methods to interpret and update mapping is critical, and that is uh, planned to be discussed early in the framework with a discussion paper. We want to establish criteria and identify features for provincial compliance, example, woodlands, develop a watershed planning policy framework. Watershed planning is an important component of the growth plan now, and we want to develop a, a framework uh, for that and, and create that early with a discussion paper to identify roles and responsibilities, et cetera, for watershed planning. Uh, other topics that have been brought up are offsetting shorelines, watercourse mapping, et cetera, that all be looked at. And then education is a priority component of the engagement process, especially for, for all of the official plan, but especially for natural heritage. Aggregate resources, uh, basically a lot of work was done in terms of creating a technical background document for aggregates when we started Imagine Niagara, which was a com consultation uh, uh, project mainly uh, to deal with growth to 2031, but we started uh, an amendment to the aggregate section of the regional plan in terms of the backgrounder, and that was completed. We held, That got held up by, uh, as you probably all recall, the province was updating all its provincial plans. So when the province did that, we waited um, to see what changes were, would be made relative to aggregates. Uh, we got that work. Uh, we had the consultant that was working on the project update the backgrounder, provide an addendum that was done. And uh, that's been uh, through regional planning committee and council, and now we'll be ready to start developing draft policies, aggregate policies for the new official plan. In terms of climate change, uh, Basically, a lot of all the sections of the growth plan uh, indirectly or directly relate to climate change, and you can see all the, the different aspects, complete communities, infrastructure, transportation, especially public transportation, water, energy, natural hazards, natural environment and agriculture, waste management, and uh, you can see optional greenhouse gas emission inventory targets and strategies. So we'll be looking at all of that. And I will say that all these frameworks I've been talking about have been completed. We got the input of area planners. They've been through the regional planning committee and uh, council, and we've started to initiate work on those. Under engagement process considerations, uh, we wanna engage the indigenous peoples early, carry forward essential information and direction, 
clear understanding that one policy decision impacts another, opportunities for council members to feel involved, consideration of the regional mandate uh, at different stages in create, uh, finalizing the background studies and then into policy, broad-based and personal consultation and provide strategic facilitation where necessary. We're gonna comply with the Planning Act requirements and then go well beyond that in terms of broad consultation, present to local councils like I'm doing tonight and keep coming back, use Imagine Niagara to theme public topics, visioning and engagement. And I will say uh, there was a significant amount of consultation done for Imagine Niagara. There was uh, over 4,000 uh, complete surveys and 2,000 resident comments that we received in kind of prioritizing themes uh, for the, the regional official plan. And, and that was back in 2013 and 14, but a lot of the information we feel is still relevant. So we were discussing uh, engagement a bit at uh, the July 5th uh, special council meeting and uh, what was brought up was some direction to come to the local municipalities, not just the local planning committees or council, but also hold an open house or workshop at each municipality with the public. And, and, and get input. So we are uh, taking a look at how to strategically do that at one or two stages through the process and we'll probably talk about some options with area planners on that. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Any questions from committee? Councilor McPherson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a just a question around urban structure. If you want to go back to that slide, and uh, if you could uh, that one there, uh, tell me what sixty percent intensification rate means. That's the amount of basically development that's going to be in the built boundaries. So what the province has done is identified you have an urban boundary, mm -hmm. uh, then you have a, a built boundary, which is generally your built up areas. Some municipalities uh, have more kind of developable land in their built boundaries than others do. It, it's not, it's not uh, black and white uh, around the region, but you have a, a built boundary. That's where your 60% intensification is. Then you have between your built boundary and your urban boundary, generally speaking, a greenfield area, which is the 80 people and jobs per hectare in the growth plan. And, and uh, you can get a, uh, an alternative target for the greenfield part. Um, so some municipalities, it's not overly difficult to achieve intensification, others it will. Um, but we, uh, we have to finalize our urban land needs assessment. That's the major component of it. And the urban structure is a significant component, uh, one of the early components to try and get um, uh, signed off by the province that it's done to a level that they feel satisfied with uh, to put to enter into your land needs assessment. That urban structure component as well as um, the greenfield density target, whether it's going to be 80 or some alternative target, to get those kind of finalized and uh, so you can complete your land needs assessment. So through you, Mr. Chair, so is that 60% more than what it is today, or I still don't know what the 60 is? What, what does that mean, 60%? Well, 60% of your development will have to be in your built boundary area. 60% of your development? Yeah. 60% yeah. yeah. of your, your community's development? Yes. Okay. So, and that's regionally. Okay, so that uh, traditionally, uh, even in the existing plan, the targets have been differentiated throughout the region by municipality. And we're likely still to do that. Um, that a lot of that work was done under uh, go, grow, and flow. Um, targets were established. We'll, we will be um, revisiting those to a degree because we have to re refine our whole urban land needs assessment. 
a part of, of what's happened is after the provincial documents were done, we had to wait for the guidance material from the province after the provincial documents came out to better explain how to do some of the analysis. And through you, Mr. Chair, if you, if you flip one more slide there, so, so I see St. Catharines, I see Niagara Falls, I see Welland. Are the other municipalities also getting some focus? Uh, yes, so uh, Lincoln would have some focus because you're one of the GO Transit secondary plan areas, and I believe we're dealing with that uh, in July, later in July, your, your secondary plan. So that would be a, um, an area of intensification. And then uh, regional corridors, potentially, where there's a, a regional road, especially as it, it goes around and along through downtowns or through uh, settlement areas, we can look at those areas, yeah. Public transit, their service community facilities. And, and kind of the benefit of looking at these areas is one, they make maximum use of services and infrastructure, but providing your intensification into those nodal areas also protect, helps protect established neighborhoods because you're providing your intense, a lot of your intensification targets into those areas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through to the delegation. So, first of all, thank you very much. I'm I'm, I'm glad you came here this evening to talk <coughs> to us about this. Um, um, an awful lot of the items that you're talking about, I think, are great. I, I, the the process itself, the openness, the transparent um, working with the various municipalities as we're going through this, I think it's great. Um, you know, the simple reality is that the, the regional official plan has a huge effect on all of our municipalities um, um, when it comes to the bottom line. So um, having, that, uh, uh, having that connectivity is, is really important. Um, a number of the things that, that we've done over the last uh, number of years between the region and the town, and in fact the region in general, there's been a lot of aspirational things that have gone on. For instance, you know, the, the, the previous thinking at the region is push things to the south, um, you know, try and develop down in the Port Colburn, Welland areas, um, um, try to encourage as it's going on down through there. The simple reality is that um, it's the north end, uh, Grimsby, Lincoln, St. Catharines, Niagara on the lake. These are the big development areas that have been going on and, and we really don't, uh, personally, I don't see that slowing down at all. Um, so it'll be nice as we go through this new official plan to, to, to I, I'm going to say, bring it more into reality than, than aspirational, like, because there's a lot of issues that this municipality has that have to be taken into account by, um, by the regional official plan. So I have one question though, and, and, and you might not be able to answer it, and I'm, I, it's just uh, throwing it out there, but uh, you know, recently we had a change of government down in Toronto. Um, um, do you foresee this having effect on us um, as, we're, as we're making our way through this? Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, actually, this came up at our meeting on July 5th, so... Um, a lot of, you mentioned aspirational types of things. Um, when we, the region did a coordinated provincial plan review, they got a lot of input from the local municipalities and there was a lot of concern about um, mapping, what would you call errors or uh, reconsiderations of mapping in the Greenbelt plan when there, where there was maybe a developed use and it's marked a specialty crop or something of that nature. Uh, and a lot of that came from Grimsby and I think in the Lincoln area as well to an extent and, and St. Catharines. And um, that all went to the province and there was no changes other than they added some lands. Uh, but I don't believe they took any out. So. Um, we continue to struggle with certain interpretations from the province per 
especially for green belt uses and uh, the mapping. And uh, with the election, we will be persistent in terms of bringing back those matters. Uh, that said, uh, the planning policy is the planning policy and we have to conform. So if there isn't any um, change uh, in terms of mapping changes or interpretation changes per se, then we're not gonna be able to do a lot, but uh, it is uh, continually heard. In fact, uh, a lot of the written comments that came in for the special council meeting related to uh, green belt plan issues and the mapping, et cetera. So it's certainly highlighted for us and we'll certainly keep bringing it forward to the province, but I don't know what will happen. Um, certainly there is a change in government. So I think a lot of people are waiting on what the platform will be. Thank you. Mayor Easton. Oh, Mr. Chairman, um, through you to Dave, thank you very much, Dave. Um, and so I'm just going to repeat what I said the other night because I want to make sure that um, um, I want to make sure that uh, there is clarity around what I think the public expectations are, and, and I'm using the demonstration of people's involvement, not just in Lincoln but also uh, in Grimsby and in West in West Lincoln. Um, I think that. Um, I think that what Councillor Foster said needs to be taken very seriously. This exercise cannot end up being a recital of policy, and I made this statement the other night. It must demonstrate, <clears throat> people's understanding must demonstrate to people a clear understanding of what our communities are going to look like in the future. We are very serious about that in Beamsville and in Lincoln as a whole. We're looking at, um, a significant exercise to assist people with an understanding of what our main thoroughfare in um, on Ontario Street could look like. The whole concept of having developers come and hand you a piece of paper that says, here's the plan, how do you like it so far, is so far removed from any idea that we have about planning that we can't, can, we can't repeat this process. And therefore, if we require a motion to um, the staff of the region in order for this project to have the time that's required to come into the areas that are growing as much as West Niagara is, then maybe we should do that. And I guess that is my question, Mr. Chairman, um, to, to Mr. Hayworth. Is that what would make it um, possible for us to achieve the, a much higher level of involvement because I haven't reached a point yet from what I heard the other night and again tonight that this is really going to happen the way I, I think it should happen. Uh, through the chair to the mayor, um, certainly there was a lot of discussion on the 5th about coming to the local municipalities and that was put into a motion. Um, so we are going to try and develop, like I mentioned, a couple of options to discuss with area planners, how to strategically do that at a couple different stages. So, you know, we have s numerous municipalities in the region and um, if you go back to the slide, yeah, so that just, you know, we have eight priority background studies going right now, there will be others and you can see the three different areas of input we're trying to get just in the background studies, let alone each policy section. So going to every local municipality at that stage probably isn't a doable item, but going to the local municipalities, the public, not just the planning committee or council, um, perhaps early on and even for educational purposes, um, and then later on when towards uh, maybe recommendations and draft policy uh, and get some input at that point in time, I think strategically we can do that. Um, so that's some options we want to play with, but, but we have a motion from regional council, so that's what we're gonna pursue in terms of seeing how we can uh, adjust things and fit that in to do. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a little different uh, when we go to the public because the regional plan is very broad in scope and covers uh, a significant amount of information and it's at a higher level in a sense that's flying at 10,000 feet. Often when we're involving the public locally, it's on a property uh, specific development where they can really relate to it. Not to say they can't provide input on something like this and they can and, and usually uh, what we hear are kind of site specific concerns as to how it affects them but we can still process that and, and relate it up, go up from the bottom up and that's beneficial too. So we have, um, we certainly uh, heard that at uh, regional council, we have the motion and we are trying to see how we can fit it, that in in a couple uh, areas. As well as uh, I mentioned, we have a significant amount of public engagement input which we still feel is um, contemporary and usable from Imagine Niagara. All right, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm, I'm satisfied. I know that our staff understand what the public are looking for, so I'm quite satisfied to have them make the decisions about that. Um, I will say that I don't think that we should underestimate at all what people either have the time to spend on these kinds of things now or their level of interest as well as the kind of expertise that they have. <laughs> this is probably the most, I think it's, it, it is the absolute, um, this is probably one of the most important exercises that we will go through in this generation. And I think that if people don't, find themselves in a situation where they can begin to look at some of those details, they're going to be perpetually um, disappointed when they hear numbers like 60% density. What does that really mean? And I think your idea of going from the bottom up is probably very appropriate. Let's flip the, the, um, the pyramid over and see what happens when you start, you know, really drilling down. Because I think that people want that. If they're bored, they will go away. But there will always, I think, from our, our experience here, be enough people whose uh, interest is captured that we really need to give them the time to, to have their say. Because it's, uh, otherwise, you know, another 10 or 15 years will go by people will be continue to be very dissatisfied with their communities. So I, I appreciate your coming out and exposing yourself once again to the same old <laughs> questions, but uh, I think we have to advocate for our communities. And, and after all, as Councillor Foster said, we are the communities that are growing. So, you know, maybe less time in areas where there isn't so much growth, but West Lincoln, um, Lincoln and, and Grimsby are growing like crazy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Mayor. Councilor Petrieva. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple questions. Thanks for coming tonight. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I'm just going to touch on the natural envi environment and water systems planning slide that you showed. Um, we talked about it, or we continually talk about it constantly, climatic change, um, though some levels of government don't think that that exists. But, you know, uh, 14 days straight of 30 plus uh, Celsius weather would tend to differ. And then our storms are, uh, tend to be more intense and more violent. So I really like the, the point about accurate mapping. Um, you know, different flood plain levels. What used to be viewed as developable land, maybe when we look at it through this critical lens, is not. And then we can explain that we had that question this evening with the subdivision in Camden. You know, it's, it might be dry 90% of the time, but that 10% makes it inhabitable. So, and then the other question, um, or actually the question that I do have, develop watershed planning policy framework. Any intention to work with the NPCA on that? Because isn't that their forte rather than try to reinvent the wheel? Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, part of uh, what I mentioned is um, 
the natural environment and water systems planning, um, one element is the watershed planning part. And we're gonna have an early discussion paper on that. And part of that will be roles or responsibilities. And we will be working with the conservation authority on that. The actual wording, I believe, in the growth plan kind of puts the onus on the region. But that's not to say that you can't work out like M memorandum of understanding partnerships with uh, different agencies, et cetera, and one maybe being the Conservation Authority. Traditionally, they've been involved in the past in coordinating watershed plans. Um, but going forward, I think the changes to the growth plan have been done to um, make sure the water systems, watershed planning, sub-watershed planning is better integrated into the planning process than when the Conservation Authority was kind of doing them, um, not arm's length, but somewhat separate. Okay, thank you. Well, I actually have a question. So, um, my question is in and around, uh, you showed a slide with some puzzle pieces which were um, natural heritage and agriculture. And, you know, as, as Lincoln is the center of excellence for agriculture, it's extremely important to us that um, the primacy of that agriculture is looked after and, and dealt with accordingly. Um, is it the region's intent to have stakeholder consultation with uh, farmers and and that sort of stuff as well as local councils in areas of of agriculture that uh, to bring important you know light to what's going on with with the map some of the mapping and some of the definitions and that sort of stuff uh, to the chair um, yes we'll be talking to the different agricultural associations that make up our association of farmers, um, as well as we'll be having kind of like a public component where we'll have open houses, et cetera. So, um, and, and part of what was talked about in terms of uh, consultation um, is uh, not just social media on the region, but getting it to the local municipalities for their social media to use to promote the open houses, et cetera. So uh, in that, line, I think there's an avenue to get the word out to the farming community from a public standpoint to come out, and then as well as the agricultural associations we'll be dealing with as well. Okay, thank you. Hopefully it won't be during their prime season. It'll be in the off season for their consultation, because that always seems to be a challenge. We'll have to consider that point, yeah. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate you coming out. I think that's everything from everybody. Great, thank you very much, I enjoyed it very much. So next on our agenda this evening is Mr. Dave Aston from MHBC Planning to present uh, regarding report PL 1845. Mr. Aston. Hey, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the committee. Um, I have a presentation here. I don't intend to uh, go through it in uh, a lot of detail. What I do want to um, update from our last public meeting, uh, we've had a number of discussions with staff uh, working toward the report and the draft bylaw and the amendment to the draft plan and conditions that are, are before you this evening. Uh, we've also um, taking into consideration the comments received from uh, the adjacent uh, landowner and looking at, uh, taking a look at the request that was made to increase uh, height limits along Highland Park Drive and have actually removed that request. Um, based on that consideration and those comments received, then uh, we've given some additional thought to what that block will look like and uh, also other blocks uh, within the subdivision. So that's kind of what I wanted to cover tonight rather than getting into the details of what the bylaw is uh, and just share some images of what we've done to illustrate how the blocks will, will work and, and be designed, uh, recognizing that 
Um, it's preliminary and as we work with staff through site planning, there'll be details that will need to be addressed. Uh, but this gives some indication on, on what's being proposed. Um, so this is just, you know, overview of the application. This is the draft plan as it's consolidated uh, with the additional lands. Uh, we've been working with uh, the town and the region as it relates to the alignment of uh, Connor Drive at Mountain Street um, and the Cross Street uh, Douglas. So that's resulted in some changes up in that corner. Uh, which we've had to reflect in zoning. And actually, uh, it's also resulted in um, this lot here now being a single detached dwelling uh, <laughs> facing Mountain Street with uh, access to Connor Drive. Uh, so that will kind of be continue the, the single detached interface there. So that's been a result of uh, the shifting road alignments and widenings there. Uh, so this is um, block 101, and uh, this is uh, the block that um, is south of Connor Drive and uh, uh, fronts onto Mountain Street. So this is one of the new blocks uh, with the addition of the land. So it's proposed for uh, three-story townhomes. Uh, so there's an additional uh, height request there for three stories and, and the 13.5 meters. But in this block, uh, what will be happening is we'll be maintaining the our rear yard setbacks and other setbacks adjacent to uh, the existing uh, residential or existing uses along that block. Uh, this is the block that as you come in Connor Drive, it's north of Connor Drive. Uh, and then this block uh, uh, backs on to the existing stormwater management pond. Uh, so there's townhouses backing onto that pond. Uh, we see that as a, as a compatible fit within that area. Uh, this, as I mentioned, there's the single detached uh, lot that's now facing Mountain Street. Uh, this is showing you know, the garage. We haven't, it will be really a custom design where there's um, a garage coming off a of corner so that the garage will be into really the rear of the unit with a, a facade facing Mountain Street. So. Uh, we see that as a good fit within that block. Uh, townhomes just don't fit, and it's a good extension and, and compatible with the existing residential. So to make that lot fit, there are some um, uh, changes to the zoning that are required, but uh, generally um, compliant and compatible with the surrounding residential. This. Uh, is Connor Drive, and this is just to show that in, in all of the blocks, we've taken a look at the design from the previous plans and looked at opportunities to uh, make them a bit more efficient, find uh, parking, and find additional green space on them. Uh, this is a rendering, so this is, we're now into the uh, northwest corner of the plan. Uh, the existing residential are, the, are depicted in, in heights in the white blocks and the proposed residential is, is rendered there. So uh, adjacent to the existing residential, this is on Connor Drive where the 10.5 meters in height will remain, uh, where it abuts the existing residential. And then the request for the increase in height is along uh, Connor Drive, uh, only along Connor Drive to the 13.5 meters for three stories. So we see that uh, providing a good transition and that will just transition into the new development uh, that's across the street on Connor Drive. Um, block 118, uh, again, uh, just uh, different rendering showing there as far as the unit type. Um, and block 119 is the large uh, multiple residential block that's uh, internal to the site as you come into uh, the site from uh, Mountain Street through Connor Drive. And we've done some renderings in, in that area. So it's uh, internal back-to-back uh, -back townhomes, uh, proposed three stories. All of the uh, townhomes have garages uh, and a driveway. So that provides uh, internal parking areas and uh, there'll be landscaping associated with that. But with back-to-backs, we've uh, requested some specific uh, zoning requirements to address uh, really the size and the frontage of them, 
and the fact that some of the setbacks just aren't there because of the design nature of back-to-back -back townhomes. So this just gives you an idea of uh, the, in the internal street uh, design. Again, the, the rendering, there would be, in this case, um, uh, there'll be more detail on the, the quality of materials, but it's looking at uh, stone materials, brick materials, and then high quality uh, uh, hardy board material. So um, that's the intent of the design there. So this is, you know, at the bottom more of a, a, a different type of artist rendering of what those units would look like. Uh, so Block 120 uh, Highland Park Drive is to uh, the south here, and this is um, where there's the adjacent property uh, further south of Highland Park Drive. Uh, in this uh, area here is a park, uh, single detached dwellings along uh, to the west. Uh, so this is the area where we were requesting the increased height uh, at the public meeting, and this is where uh, there's been a change to that design uh, to remove that requirement and to have, um, the current design is to have two-story townhouses fronting Highland Park Drive, but the way that the grade is and it's falling uh, back to uh, the adjacent property to the north, uh, these townhomes will have a three-story condition in the rear. So it'll be two-story at the front and three-story in the rear with rear lane uh, garage. So this gives you um, indication of the view. Uh, we had the um, uh, ability from uh, the property owner to access the property, which we're thankful for to be able to uh, use this uh, imagery to provide this rendering. So you can see a two-story uh, product. Uh, there's no driveways. Those are showing sidewalks uh, and front entries and the garages and driveways would be to the rear. Uh, so this would be a, a more of a two-story product. Again, just giving you an idea of a, a different uh, look, um, artistic rendering. In this case, where those units would face uh, Highland Park Drive, those garages would be um, you know, windows and for uh, living areas. And just a few more examples of the design considerations of the back-to-back, -back, so the, the front and the side elevations. So attention is really given to all sides of the building as it relates to the uh, design elements and the use of materials. And then an example of a, a side elevation for a two-story building. Uh, so we're here uh, supporting the staff recommendations and uh, uh, agree with the conclusions as it relates to uh, conformity with policies uh, locally, regionally, and provincially, and uh, you know, look forward to continuing to work with staff to uh, implement uh, the uh, decision, uh, should that be approved this evening, and to continue to work with staff on fulfilling the conditions of approval, which there are many, uh, in including those associated with engineering, um, traffic, uh, your, your typical requirements uh, for plans of subdivision. And we're also working with staff through details associated with uh, urban design, which will then also inform uh, the future site plans that would be required for each of the blocks where we're requesting the changes to the zoning bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ashton. Thank you for bringing pictures. Those are very helpful. Uh, are there any questions uh, to the presenter from committee? Councillor Foster. Thank you, and I want to echo the uh, chair's comments. It's it's much better to actually see um, what's going on. I, I have a curiosity question for you um, concerning the back-to-back -to -back, um, uh, townhouses. Um, uh, I guess Councillor Patrick and I uh, lived through the fairgrounds um, um, uh, issues here in our municipality and the one of the early things that they had uh, brought forward um, was back-to-backs that, that they wanted to do and uh, DeSantis had a, a very difficult time selling that um, 
is there something about the marketplace now or is there something that Lausanne is looking at that, that makes this attractive? I mean, I, I'm, I find it kind of weird because I, I, you know, we live in a municipality that that is, encourages, um, you know, like we're a rural or, and, and all these other differing pieces. So there's no property that's involved with these. It's just, a, you know, a big house that's sitting on the thing. So I'm just curious, um, um, I don't know, if, if you know, maybe you don't, but um, um, why Lozani wants to go down the road with this. Sure, uh, to you, Mr. Chair, I can just share what I know just in working um, with Lozani Homes and other projects uh, really throughout. Uh, Niagara, uh, Hamilton, um, Brank County, uh, the back-to-backs as far as uh, the market have, have been successful. I don't know why others haven't been, but um, I think it's really a function of, of design, uh, change and affordability in the location and the market that they're in. Uh, and I've seen other back-to-backs where they, where they haven't uh, included a garage and they've really uh, kind of maximize the footprint and instead of having a garage and a driveway that ground floor is is living space so uh, what what Lozani is finding is being able to provide uh, a still one garage for each unit is is good for the market so I think it's a, a combination of, of those two factors um, it's an it really becomes an uh, affordable home ownership choice um, in the context of uh, moving from you know, back-to-backs to say uh, into a low-rise or mid-rise apartment, uh, what we're seeing is that the market is there for back-to-backs before moving into a lower mid-rise apartment. Welcome, Councillor Council Pachereva, yep. and then Councillor Timmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Mr. Aston. For your presentation. Um, so just to be 100% clear, the two-story towns on Highland Park Drive, mm -hmm. two-story at the front. Yes. So the garage will be on the back taking into account the lay of the land, so it'll be three-story at the back. That's correct. So, and then that's that 10 and a half meters so height at the front? It, um, I guess that would roughly be ten and a half meters. Okay. We, we haven't. Uh, that's the challenge because it's the walkout. We still need to have the height, so we're not constrained in, in the backside of measuring the height. But the intent is to have a, a two-story townhouse condition, as we were showing there. Okay. And uh, you know, we'll we'll work with staff on that through site plan. But that's the okay. intent. Okay. And I appreciate you. Um, and, you know, being the ward councillor, taking into account the residents' concerns and, and coming back with uh, with this plan, uh, you know, uh, right now it's it seems acceptable. I mean, and I, I love the finishes on the um, towns; they're much better than what's presently there, and I think you know will will do the community well. Uh, just a, a question to staff: Do just to further. I guess cement concerns, and 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 uh, I thought of the term that I wanted to use, or, or driving down here, and then it, it lasts me. Uh, Kathleen, any any um, um, merit of using you know architectural control on that block in order to get a certain defined height? Because again, just to take out that, um, you know. There's another word I want to use. Uncertainty, that's the word. So to have some certainty to that height to once and for all put the put the height concerns to rest. Director Dale. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, the way that our, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that our zoning bylaw defines height, it's actually the highest point of the building. Um, so the applicants, that's why they need, like, they're, they actually withdrew their request to mm -hmm. increase the height yeah. uh, for this particular block. They wanted to go a little bit higher. Um, so their intent is to build it in conformance with what is currently permitted in the zoning bylaw, which they previously got approval for. Um, so the reason um, they need to be able to maintain the existing height within the zoning bylaw is because our definition says total height. So it's gonna be measured from the highest spot off the ground, which means 
if the back is three stories, you're going to need um, extra height to, for, for the rear part of the dwelling, even though the front part may only be two stories. I understand that. So the, in, the, in the back, three, Mr. Chairman, and then the back side will be the north. So it actually is dropping by the grade of the land, correct? Um, Mr. Chairman, yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, so on the south side facing Harland Park Drive, the intent is those would be two stories. And then the back side of the houses where the garages are going to be um, facing north, that portion of the dwelling would be three stories mm -hmm. because it's going to be a walkout. Yeah, measured from the bottom. But I mean, technically, your, your, your roof line's not going to have a pitch from south to north, right? It'll be level. More le relatively speaking. More or less. Yeah, okay. So again, that just, just verbalizing that way lays, I think, your concerns. Uh, through Mr. Chair, if I, I might add to that to, to throw some additional information. We, we have the urban design guidelines as a requirement, as a condition to the draft plan of subdivision. Um, I should know this, but I, but I don't recall, but it's something that uh, we can work with, uh, with, with Ms. Dale to specifically put some language there, kind of two-story on Highland Park Drive into the design guidelines. I don't, we don't have an issue doing that, so I'll follow up with, with Ms. Dale. If it's not in there and what we submitted as a draft, we'll certainly make sure that, that it's in there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McPherson, then Mayor Easton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ashton, for coming. Um, I had to go through this thing a number of times trying to figure out what, where lot uh, 119 or lot 118 or where they fit. And <laughs> is there any thought to putting it all together on one drawing that uh, you've now got? You know, here's where the three stories are, and it's a pictorial 3D, whatever, that you, we could see it all on one drawing. That's a, that's a question. Right. Um, and, and I guess um, I'm, I'm looking at some of these um, little developments with all of the townhomes, and I'm wondering, is this is this a um, town uh, serviced piece of road for snowplow and whatnot in all of these little developments, or is it is it um, is it the condo owners that are serv servicing their own roads? Because it looks from the drawing that they're very tight. You know, you've got a pretty tight, tight road in there. And I guess, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I appreciate, you know, all the, all the parking that you probably have added, but I wonder, you know, about turnarounds and about um, servicing those, those little, you know, what, well, you've got a couple of them are larger, but you've got, uh, I, I looked at that 119 with the black colored, uh, it's not 119, probably 118. With the black buildings, that one there, and that looks pretty tight to roll in there with a snow plow and figure that out. How are they being serviced? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, the internal roads would be private roads. Are they on private? Um, so they'll be based on kind of the standard width of the requirements of, of private roads. Um, and again, the, really those details, we've looked at the, the design now. Uh, we think we have something that generally works. We'll be working through those, uh, each block individually, site plan approval. So we'll be working with town staff and uh, getting input on on the design as it relates to uh, how those work, um, truck turnarounds or snow removals in, in private scenarios, it's you know can be a bit different, um, but that would be the intent, and we'll we'll certainly work through the site plan requirements to address those types of details. We did look at. Uh, um, rendering the whole site, and in fact, I don't have it with me, but we had our co-op student render the entire site. And it, uh, if I would have put it up, but you would have said that I can't tell anything from that because there's so many units in, uh, on it. So we really just tried to focus into the, the certain areas um, to give you a, a picture of where we were actually proposing change and, 
and to see how that was all fitting together in relation to those blocks. Yeah, I guess, and and uh, what I was thinking was, if you even if you had a diagram of the whole site, and then you know you you pulled out of that particular piece, here's the homes that are going to go in here. You know, so from a video standpoint, here's what's here's what's popping out of here, and and you have this drawing that just something like that from a. Maybe maybe it's not on a printed piece, but in a in a, some kind of some kind of video presentation. But yeah, I guess video is a good point. We tried to do it on on this plan as far as the, the colors to illustrate kind of where the different right. types of multiple blocks and street townhouses were happening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. My apologies, Councillor Timmer. I jumped the queue on you and gave Mr. <laughs> Councillor McPherson the, the shot at it. So. Go ahead, please. No problem. Thank you, uh, Chair Thompson. I think some of my questions have been answered. I, I find it's you know very tight and it it does look very busy. And I guess my my thoughts when we were looking at the pictures is parking. Each unit is going to have how many cars in the driveway? Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Each unit will have a garage and a driveway, so and then there'll be additional parking that's uh, required by the town's bylaws. So we're not. Uh, we're not adjusting or requesting reduced parking requirements, so that'll be a, a typical requirement through the uh, through the site plan process. I guess I just have concerns. You know, we've seen it in other neighborhoods in town, and people have one car, so they need one car in the garage and one car in the driveway. And if they don't park in the garage, we have cars all over the street. So that's just, that's my concern. I just see it happening again here. People are gonna have two cars and we can't force them to put one in the garage. So I, I just, I don't know, I just see it repeating itself here. So that's that's my one main concern. I don't really have a, I don't know if we're meeting the parking requirement maybe through to uh, actually, Dale. Actually, Mrs. Dale has a, okay, has thank you, a response Thompson. to your parking and in the garage question. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, no, we can't force somebody to physically put their car in the garage. However, what we can do is we can put uh, clauses in the subdivision agreement and through the site plan approval stage require visitor parking for things that are developed as blocks. There's also existing conditions of draft approval that require that they, they provide a certain ratio of uh, visitor parking in the entire subdivision, um, and it's 40%. Um, what we've been doing on a go-forward basis in the subdivision agreements as well as any site plan um, agreements is a clause on title that the developer has to notify any prospective purchasers that the garages are intended for parking your car and that on-street parking cannot be guaranteed. Okay, thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Mary Easton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Aston, for your presentation. Um, so I'm going to say it to you, and I've said it to all other developers. This is a very, um, this is a very intensive plan for this area, and <clears throat> I think that um, Lasani Homes is certainly putting a lot of emphasis on the design. Features. Um, I appreciate that. I think we all do. We know that uh, the materials that will be used will be very high grade. We understand that. And we've certainly seen the work of the company. But for whatever reason, the company does not get the point that it is not possible um, for councils to be making decisions on one dimensional drawings. And the little piece that you have provided with that three the, with the three-dimensional rendering is very helpful. But we have seen other plans here where more consideration is given for our ability to truly judge and for the public to judge what it's going to be like to move through this community. It's my opinion that Losani Homes are building enough that they can well manage to use technology to better advantage for our purposes only, for the selfish purpose of having a committee or council be able to see exactly 
how this is going to be impacted, what this community is going to be like to live in. It's not just a matter of following the policy. We want to be able to look at it. So I will continue to harp on this until all the developers get it. Um, for those that do, it is very much appreciated every time we can see that detail. So I send you away with that message because I feel that every time we are forced into making decisions with the minimum of technology applied, we are doing a disservice to our community. And I think that the developers are as well. The technology is there. A lot of it is available offshore. Other developers are using it and I don't understand why we are not seeing it here. I really am disappointed that at this stage that we are not being able to move through this subdivision with, with, with considerable ease to be able to see exactly what the relationships are to new and old. So I'll leave that with you. My question for you is because of the, of the density, I'm curious to know where the position of the utilities are because I want to make sure that they're not visible from the street. So with you, Mr. Chair, the utilities as it relates to the broader plan of subdivision, uh, that's uh, been part of uh, discussions with the utilities, with town staff, uh, and has been part of uh, uh, the second engineering submission for the broader subdivision uh, component uh, within the plan of subdivision. So that's all part of the uh, streetscape plan that's required to be submitted as a condition of approval, uh, which considers location of utilities, um, kind of street street furniture, which I'll call your, your hydro boxes and those types of things, and also uh, tree planting. So that's something that we're working through uh, now in detail with uh, staff and utilities. And with the site plan blocks or the multiple blocks, um, certainly that's something that we can work with town staff on identifying locations so that uh, they are not uh, visible. I, I completely understand what you're saying. You have a a uh, well-designed block and then there's a hydro box right right out in front which uh, then by uh, <coughs> design criteria you're not even allowed to plant around our screen so uh, we'll we'll do our best to work with staff and and the utilities to make sure that you know you don't drive into the community right into uh, a large uh, utility <coughs> uh, infrastructure component Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to comment on the additional detail that staff have provided us in the report in regard to the grading, because it is, the, I think, one of the first times that we've seen um, very, very specific attention being paid to the fact that, you know, if drainage is really what we're looking at as the priority, there are opportunities when um, it does change, the grade, the, the grade does change, and you know, we don't really want people to have those kinds of surprises. So I think the detail that has been provided here uh, is really fair and, and it's, it's very open and it does cause questions to be asked and I think it appropriately, uh, appropriately should do that. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Mr. Aston. Thank you very much. Any other questions from committee? Team, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a motion moved by uh, Councillor McPherson and seconded by Mayor Easton that the presentations by delegations be received. Committee's pleasure on that motion. Motion is carried. We have no items of correspondence for this evening's meeting. We'll go right into the reports section. First report is PL 18 44, noise exemption application by Redstone Winery. I have a motion moved by Councillor Timmers, seconded by Councillor Foster. That for reasons outlined in PL 18-44, it's hereby recommended that the noise bylaw exemption application 2018-03 by Redstone Winery Incorporated, as outlined in this pre report, be approved. Subject to the following conditions. A, Redstone Winery Incorporated complies with the noise bylaw an exemption granted for the event dates and times outlined in this report. B, the event organizer shall notify all neighboring property owners within 500 meters of an entire property boundary in writing, a minimum of 10 days in advance of the start of the event, 
Copy of the written notice shall be provided to the town for approval prior to being distributed. C, that the above notification shall provide the neighboring property owners with a direct telephone number to call during the event should the neighbors experience any noise concerns. D, that the event organizer shall respond to and take appropriate corrective action to any noise complaints to minimize any disturbances from the event to the best extent possible. And E, if the town is required to respond to any legitimate noise complaints, the event organizer will be responsible for payment of the town's noise complaint inspection fee. Are there any questions to the report or to the motion from committee? Committee's pleasure on this motion? The motion is carried. The next report on our agenda this evening is PL 18-45, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application and Revisions to Draft Plan of Subdivision by 241-0002 in Ontario Limited. I have a motion moved by Mayor Easton and seconded by Councilor McPherson. That for reasons outlined in PL 18-45, it's hereby recommended that the modifications to draft plan of subdivision PL sub 2015-0098 by 241-0002, Ontario Incorporated, be approved in accordance with the plan outlined in Appendix A and subject to the revised conditions outlined in Appendix D and that the Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application PLZBA 2017-0153 in the name of 241-0002 Ontario Incorporated be approved. That an H holding provision be affixed to the zoning of the lands to be added to the draft plan of subdivision and that the H holding provision not be removed in all or in part until the following conditions have been met. A. The applicant has entered into a subdivision agreement and the agreement has been registered on title. B, the applicant has entered into a site plan agreement where required and the agreement has been registered on title. C, the applicant has submitted a letter of credit and cash payments required by the agreement. And D, the applicant has completed the primary services within the respective phase of the subdivision. Are there any questions to the report? For the motion, uh, Councillor Foster. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And so a question through to staff. Um, um, through the various public meetings and through um, um, even the discussion earlier this evening about uh, changes and stuff that have gone on, um, is staff, uh, has staff satisfied or are we in a spot where we can say that at least most of the public concerns that have come forward have been addressed and uh, um, and you know we can move on with with a strong level of satisfaction that this is a this is a quality um, subdivision that's going in place that isn't going to rankle too many people um, through you mr. chairman I would say that um, yes the majority of the public concerns have been addressed um, they are outlined in detail in the staff report Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Committee's pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. Next on our agenda is report PL 18-46, proposed official regional official plan amendments uh, update to transportation policies. I have a motion moved by Mayor Easton, seconded by Councillor McPherson. That for the reasons outlined in PL 18-46, it's hereby recommended that a copy of PL-1846 be forwarded to the Regional Planning and Development Department and that the region be advised that the town supports official, Regional Official Plan Amendment Number 13. Are there any questions or comments to the report? Or the motion? Seeing none, your pleasure on the motion. Okay, motion's carried. Next report on the agenda is 18-47. <clears throat> Pre-servicing agreement Vista Ridge for phase one by 241-0002 Ontario Incorporated. I have a motion moved by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor Timmers. 
that for reasons outlined in PL 18-47, it's hereby recommended that a bylaw be presented to Council for the approval to authorize the execution and pre-servicing agreement for Phase 1 of the Vista Ridge subdivision with 241-0002 Ontario Incorporated Limited. An agreement be finalized subject to A, the final approval of the engineering plans by the development engineering staff and all applicable agencies. B, the final approval of the engineering estimates by development engineering staff to reflect the final engineering plans. And C, review of the agreement by the town solicitor. The servicing of blocks, lot 100 and blocks 101 to 104, 119, 124, 125, and 126 within phase one not proceed until a letter of acknowledgement has been received from the Ministry of Tourism, Cultural Recreation, confirming that all archaeological resource concerns have been met licensing and resource conservation requirements. Is there any questions <laughs> to the report? Councillor Petrieva. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, I guess a, a question to Mr. Krakopoulos, our CAO. Um, so by passing this pre-servicing agreement tonight, does that mean that the um, construction of Prokich Park will be able to commence? Mr. CAO. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the simple answer to the councillor is uh, yes, once some of these uh, provisions are met, we're still waiting for a letter uh, from uh, the ministry as you read in, in one of the conditions uh, that are highlighted in the report. We have been, uh, and the reason you have this pre-servicing agreement in front of you is we have been working uh, diligently uh, with Mr. Lozani and his team, some of which are, are here today, uh, to ensure that uh, some of the, the works, uh, some of the ground works uh, can begin for the park and that we can move forward uh, in an appropriate manner. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Is that sufficient, Councillor? That's sufficient. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments? Any questions to the motion? Seeing none, committee's pleasure on the motion. The motion is carried. That was the last report for this evening. Are there any council inquiries this evening? Seeing none, are there any notices of motion this evening? Seeing none. There's no closed session for this evening and seeing as there's no further business this evening, I call this meeting adjourned at 9.20.